Hello and welcome to the Online Baby Lab. We are glad you found us. Today we'll be talking about an interesting topic for parents and researchers. Books with labs, like this one here. Yeah. Um, are they good for your child's development or not? Talking with us about this issue is Dr. Jean Shinsky, Senior Lecturer and Director of the Baby Lab at Royal Holloway University of London. Welcome Dr. Shinsky and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Okay, great Dr. Shinsky. So, uh, your work about toddlers learning from uh, Lift the Flap books is hot off the press. In fact, it has not even been published yet, but you presented it at a conference last month. So, in your research, you looked at what children learn from Lift the Flap books, like this one here. Can you briefly summarize your research findings and tell us what you observed? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was interested in whether children actually learn the information that educational picture books aim to teach. So um, we know it's good to expose your children to picture books from very early on, even from the start, if you can, um, because it's it's important to establish a love of reading for um, you know future uh, future success in life. Um, so. One of the things that uh, some researchers have suggested from other labs is that uh, manipulative features in children's picture books might actually distract. They're designed to encourage children's attention towards the book and get them interacting with books in the very early years, but they might actually be distracting children's attention away from the content that's in the book. And if you're using a picture book for the purpose of um, educating children rather than just for entertainment or fun, like reading a storybook, but you want to teach them some factual information about things that are out there in the world, that might not be the best idea. So um, a couple of studies have suggested manipulative features like flaps and touch and feel, those, those types of things might um, not be helping children or might be distracting their attention from what they're um, hearing the person read about in the book. So in this study, we wanted to look at a lift the flap book. Um, and so what we did was we um, we took some two year olds. So they were just um, a couple months before or after their second birthday. And we split them into two groups and had them come into the lab uh, with their parents. And half of the toddlers saw a lift the flap book where um, the flaps were all operable so they could they could play with them however they wanted to. And the researcher would um, would go through the book and talk about the different things in the book. And then the other half of the children got exactly the same book, except we just sealed the flaps shut with laminate so that not, they can't pick anything up off the page, but otherwise it's exactly the same information apart from the flap. And um, in this particular study, I wanted to look at, um, I wanted to choose an unfamiliar object that two-year-olds wouldn't already know the name of, and then try to teach them what it was called from the picture book. And in this particular book, there were lots of examples of fruits and vegetables, and most of them are things that uh, toddlers would know, like uh, grapes or orange, things like that. Um, but there, there were a couple of examples that were less common. So for British two-year-olds, um, the examples in this case were the watermelon was fairly um, maybe half or less or fewer of the children knew uh, what watermelon referred to. Um, and the most unfamiliar one was this star fruit. So in this particular book, they're trying, they're using the flaps to teach about the names of the shapes that are underneath the flaps. So um, this page is all about shapes. So cheese is square, an orange is round, an egg is oval, uh, watermelon is crescent shaped, star fruit is star shaped, and so on. So um, we decided to because um, only one of all of the children that we invited to the lab actually knew what that was, and the other 30 or so uh, did not know what Star referred to as confirmed by their parents. Um, so what we did was we, we read through the book with them. Um, so half of the kids got this book, half of the kids got that book. And um, the researcher went through the book and she labeled um, every uh, fruit and vegetable six times and talked about its attributes like you would do in a naturalistic picture book reading session. So she would say, um, and we used the Latin name for star fruit, which is carambola. And the reason that we did that is because some two year olds knew what the shape of a star was, but all none of them except for one actually knew what star fruit was. So we didn't want them to get it 
to get the question right based on the shape rather than on the fruit. So we called it carambola and the researcher would say, this is carambola, carambola grows very far away. You might not have had carambola before. And she would talk about it in that way. And she made sure she labeled it six times each. And then in order to test whether children learned what the word carambola referred to, um, so she read through the picture books exactly the same way for both groups of children. Um, and then both groups of children we tested with picture recognition. And we did this for all the fruits and vegetables in the book, but I'll just give you the example of the carambola. So we would show them, so we're all done with the picture book reading session and we're just gonna show them some pictures. So she would, um, she would show them these three pictures and the target is the carambola in the middle. And then there are two distractors, which are kind of not very familiar fruits to children at this age, but they look kind of similar in terms of uh, color and size. So it's a lime slice and a kiwi slice. And we would ask the child, uh, show me carambola and look at which one they pointed to. So they don't, they're not verbalizing very much at this age. They're not talking a whole lot. Um, so all they had to do was point to it. Um, so we tested, their recognition of carambola with pictures. And then we also tested it with objects. So we have some um, really realistic fake food um, replicas, which are, are great fun and children were quite interested in them. So ideally, if you want to know whether a child has learned in the context of a picture book, what word refers to what objects, you would want to test it with real objects as much as you can. So it was the same structure. So we would show them these three things and then say, uh, show me carambola and whichever one they touched or picked up first is what we counted as um, as their choice. And what we found is that, okay, so if children recognize what carambola refers to, then they should pick the star fruit um, more often than a third of the time. So in both the picture case and in the object case. And what we found was that um, the children who had the book with the flaps were completely random. So 33% of the time they picked the star fruit, 33% of the time the lime, 33% of the time uh, the kiwi. So they didn't, they were random in terms of whether they recognized what Carambola referred to both with the objects and with the pictures. So that was the flap group. The children who got the book with no flaps um, were about 70% likely to learn which stimulus, which uh, object and which picture were Carambola. So we concluded from that, that in this, in this case at least, that the flaps are a hindrance to children's picking up new words. Um, and it, it could be just a simple case of distracting their attention is probably the simplest answer. Okay, thank you so much for that summary. It is certainly fascinating research. And I think it has many interesting implications for our understanding how children learn words from children books. Um, so I would just have a few clarification questions about how you did your study and what the procedures were. Of course. So the first one is I did notice that the um, the flaps that you used did not seem to have a relation to the actual object that was underneath the flap. So when you have a regular book, you open the flap, there's something that sort of yeah. furthers the story. Was it the case that the f content underneath the flaps was under unrelated to what was on the flap in your books? Uh, apart from the shape similarity, yes. So, uh, no, it's it's just a, a yellow star. So underneath each one of these foods is a shape that has a similar shape. So I think the author's goal here was to help children learn about shapes because this is a book this, that is about children's first 100 words. Starfruit is a, so uncommon that it's probably not one of their first 100 words. Star potentially could be. So I, my, my guess is that was the aim of, of doing that. Okay, so that then brings me to my next question is, do you think if the content under the flap was related to the image on the flap, that that would have helped language development rather than hinder word learning as it was in your case? For example, showing the cut fruit when you open the flap and the full fruit without opening the flap. I think it probably will. Um, and that's a, yeah, that's a great question and something that um, I didn't actually think of until I presented this at the conference just a couple weeks ago. Um, but from, because I also want to, um, I'm starting to look into research on very young children's learning from apps versus traditional picture books. And I know that this question has already been posed in the case of apps that with 
interactive features, um, if they are relevant to the information being presented, then they seem to be more likely to help children learn new information and less likely to hinder it. So if, if for example, you were using a flap to teach about like the example you gave, you show what the inside of a star fruit looks like or an animal book that shows, I don't know, say you lift the wing of a bird and you see that there's skin underneath feathers or something that where there is a meaningful relation between um, the flap and the information that is on top of it or underneath it. Um, and so I suspect that if you were trying to use flaps to teach the concept of open and shut you open and shut a flap, you could have a picture of a door or a window being open and shut. And I suspect that that the results could be very different in that case. Okay, that's very interesting. So my next question is about the, the actual flaps and their purpose. So I study motor development and I, I like flaps. Yes. And I also talked about this with um, children's librarians and kindergarten teachers. And they also told me that they do like the manipulatives that flaps offer because they do encourage interest and they foster exploration. And my own research actually shows that if we encourage fine motor development, that is yeah. beneficial to language development. And there's other research showing that relation to that fine motor skills might foster language skills. So why yeah. do you think does it not work in this case? What is going on? Is it is it a distraction? Do the children fail to divide their attention between the motor aspect of lifting the flap and pulling on it and the attending to the word? Or what is your sense of why do children not learn this in your study? What, what do you think is going on? Yeah, so um, I think that it's, I don't know to what extent, we didn't actually measure attention and I do, ha I haven't actually even finished <laughs> coding all of the data. I just focused on a couple of measures for the purposes of presenting it at the conference, but um, I would like to measure, we videotape all the sessions, and I would like to measure children's visual attention to the book and how, uh, whether that has any influence on on the extent to which they learned what the word referred to or not. Um, so it could be, it could be a case of that with very young children at age two, it might be that if attention is divided between their sensory systems, so if they're doing something tactilely and also visually and also with their ears, um, so with, with touch, vision, and ears, they might not be able to um, take in all of the information to the same extent as if they were only doing one or two of those things. So that's that would be my suspicion. So I think maybe it might just be more multi-sensory distraction or overload, if you will. Um, and probably this sort of stuff is good for fine motor skill. I don't know if people have looked at that in the context of uh, picture books, but maybe that is one of the goals of publishers is not just to teach words, but to teach maybe hand-eye coordination or fine motor skill. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting um, interaction there going on with the fine motor skills being good for language in some sense because you extract more features, but the act of engaging in a fine motor activity might be distracting yourself from that very word that you are trying to learn in that very moment. Yeah. Um, so I guess your verdict is that picture books with flaps are not all bad and that we can still use them. They still have a place in, in our kindergartens and family homes. I would, I would like to say that because I, I know there has been, uh, so there, one of the news reports came out on um, one of the British newspapers and there were lots of comments um, from people in the public saying that um, that their fondest memories of books as, as a child were lift the flap books and that, um, you know, I'm sort of saying we're taking away the joy of childhood and I did that was not my intention at all. Um, I think, yeah, they have their place. Um, it depends what you want to use them for. If it's for entertainment, for storybook purposes, it it probably doesn't matter. And again, you could, I mean, from the standpoint of getting kids interested in books as early as possible, anything that gets them interested in books is probably not a bad thing. But I think if you want to know which features of educational picture books, which are for factual information, like word learning, shapes, colors, and so forth, if you want to know which features help 
children to learn the information in them and which features hinder, I think it's important to do research on those sorts of questions. Um, and in this particular case, um, with word learning, uh, it seems like it, it could be more of a hindrance. And, and maybe it's just because they're so young that they can't um, pay attention to multiple things at the same time. And, and this might be one reason why children like to read the same book over and over and over again, because they do pick up new information each time. So I wouldn't be surprised if you gave children, if children looked at this book, maybe, I don't know, 10 times, maybe there would be no difference between the flap and the no flap um, as possible. That's an interesting possibility. So you mentioned briefly in the beginning that this might hold for other manipulative books as well, like sensory touch and feel books, although there is no flap to be opened. Um, so do you think that if I had a book that is, I have another one here, and it has like a see-through portion, so I can see through that one, is that equally distracting, or do you think that that's a, a different ball game, something that cannot relate to your findings directly? Um, yeah, we don't know yet. And actually, this is the focus of my next grant application um, is looking at touch and feel books and word learning in much younger children. So more around 15 months or so, um, because the, they don't have as good fine motor skill as older children to do the three dimensional flap lifting. Um, and texture seems to be the most common manipulative feature in baby books. Um, to my knowledge, there's no research on it. Um, I'm a bit more... Um, tentative about which direction, if anything, those results could go because texture is more two-dimensional than three-dimensional, so it might be less interfering. Um, and also, it's possible that, at least with some of the baby books that I've seen, um, the texture might be more directly relevant to the information on the page. So a lot of the animal books will have a patch of wool for a woolly sheep, and sheep are woolly, so that, that manipulative feature is directly relevant to one of the characteristics of the thing that's being taught about. Um, so I think in, in that case, there's potential for texture to help or to make no difference possibly, or it could hinder. We just don't know, there's no research. So definitely many avenues for future research to explore. Okay, that's been very enlightening. Thank you so much for explaining your study to us. I hope that parents get something out of this and pay a little more attention to what they're doing when they are reading a book, especially a book with flaps, if this is the purpose of actually learning those 100 words, or if it is just for getting the child to sit down and enjoy a book with the parent and socialize, which often go together, but as your research shows, there might be some differences in focus if you use the flaps and if you don't use the flaps. All right, so with that, let's say thank you, Dr. Shinsky, and good luck with publishing that research. and future grants. And if you have new findings, maybe we get you back and talk about those in the future. Definitely. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found this information helpful. If you liked it, please like, comment and subscribe to our channel. And we will be back soon with more latest news on research findings and child development.